Alright, we are live. Hey, let me see if this is coming through loud and clear. I think it is. Hope it is. <laughs> Fingers crossed it is. Hello, it's Lee Hayward here, back again with a live video Q&A for the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. And the way that these video chats work is I'm going to be hanging out here for the next little while, usually about an hour or so, answering questions and topics of discussion that you may have when it comes to fitness and nutrition. So if you have any questions about building muscle, losing fat, getting in your best shape, any specific challenges with regards to your workouts, your eating plan, anything at all, feel free to type those questions and topics of discussion into our chat window there, and I'll do the best that I can to help you out over the course of our chat today. So just wait for a few people to pop on the live Q&A, and first off, before we get started and diving into things, is this coming through loud and clear? So for those of you who are tuning in right now, can you hear me? Can you see me? Is this actually coming through loud and clear? I want to double check and make sure. Let's see. Uh, make sure the audio is coming through. I think it is. Hopefully it is coming in. Thank you, Robert. Says it's coming through loud and clear. I always want to do a double check on that because you never know. <laughs> you can always hope for the best, but you really never know, right? Until it seems fine on my end, but it's not my end that I'm worried about. It's you, right? These chats are for you. So I want to make sure it's coming through loud and clear on your end. So we have Robert joining in. we got YT joining in. Dan's joining in. AJ is joining in. Welcome, welcome. Uh, last week, we did not have a video chat. I was actually out of town. I was attending a bike event, a bicycle event. It was a, a big sportive bike event that we have. And I was all gung-ho for it. Packed up my bike and gear. Traveled, you know, out of town to go to this event. It's uh, the Bon Rex. And it was a 140-kilometer bike ride. And big group ride, about 100 participants in this ride. And about 30 kilometers into the ride, one of my back sp spokes on the wheel broke. And this wheel has had a few spokes break over the summer. So I had a spoke break and it threw the wheel totally out of alignment. It was actually striking off the frame. So I had to basically call for help and, and abandon the ride. So it was a big disappointment for me because I had planned this out, you know, booked an Airbnb and everything else, traveled out of town so to get 30 kilometers into a ride and then have to abandon ship and come home out of it. But that's the reason why I wasn't here last week, because I was out of town attending that event or getting ready for that event, which was on Saturday, so traveling and stuff on Friday. So we didn't have a chat last Friday, but we'll make up for it today, this Friday. So let's see who we got joining in. We got Steve joining in. We have Yeg... Um, JS joining in. I can't pronounce your name, but I'm going to call you JS. That's your initials joining in. We got Rob's joining in. Welcome, welcome. Glad to have you tuning in. And let me know where you're tuning in from. Let me know what part of the woods you're tuning in from, what neck of the woods, what time it is in your local area. I always say that these video chats go live at 5. That's 5 p.m. Eastern time. But in my local time zone, I live in Newfoundland, that's actually 6.30. So it's just after 6.30 here for me, 6.34 to be exact. So what time is it where you're to? Let's see. We got uh, Neil is joining in from the Philippines. Welcome, Neil. And it's obviously in the morning there because he's saying good morning. And again, we got people from all over the globe joining in. So it's always nice to see. We got Steve over in the UK at 10 p.m. Getting a bit late, but hey, it's a Friday night. I guess you're allowed to stay up late on a Friday night. We got Rob joining in from MS. Um, MS, MS. Where's and Where's MS? I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank right now. All right. So, guys, the, again, the way these video chats work, Mississippi. Okay. There we go. Never been to Mississippi before. All right. Uh, we got Andrew joining in from the ghouls. All right. It's just over, over the road. All right. Yeah. And we have Trevor from Arizona. Welcome. Welcome. Piercy's joining in. And he's from Arkansas. Awesome. Some different places that I've never been to. I've never been to the UK. Never been to Mississippi. Never even been to Arkansas. I've been to the Ghouls, though. Been to Arizona before. <laughs> never been to the Philippines either. All right. So some places I'll have to travel for sure. If I ever do travel to those areas, I'll have to, have to meet up. You'll have to show me the way. Here we go. 
All right, so again, guys, the way these video chats work is I'm going to be hanging out here answering any questions and topics of discussion that you may have. So if there is anything that you would like to discuss regarding training, nutrition, building muscle, losing fat, or any specific challenges with your workouts, you know, be it injuries or um, things that you're working around, feel free to type them into the chat window, and I'll do the best that I can to help you out during our chat. And uh, we got some questions coming through there saying, what's the fastest way to drop 20 pounds in six weeks in order to join the military? All right. That's when it, this from YT. I'm not a huge fan of fast weight loss. I mean, it, it's possible. Don't get me wrong. We can certainly do it. It is absolutely possible to do that. But the thing with fast weight loss is it usually leads to fast rebound as well. Because in order to quickly drop weight, you have to go to some extreme measures. And very often those extreme measures are not sustainable as a long-term approach. So um, it, it all depends on, and you got to look at the bigger picture, and it depends on what it is you're trying to achieve and why you're achieving it for. So if you're just looking for some short-term quick fix and you don't care about the long-term, then you, know, you can kind of justify going to extremes for the short-term thing. I'll give you some examples of that. Like if you think of a movie actor who's trying to get ready for a role, but then after that role, they don't care what they look like afterwards or a bodybuilder who's trying to peak for a photo shoot or a competition. And, you know, they just want to hit their peak and they don't really care what they look like afterwards. You know, you can kind of justify these short term, quick fix solution type of approaches. But for the majority of people, and I'm willing to bet the majority of people tuning into this video chat you're not looking to just lose weight for the short term and then don't care what you look like afterwards. It's like you want this to be a lifestyle. You want to lose the fat, keep it off, and enjoy the process and sustain it, right? Not just lose 20 pounds in six weeks and then six months later you put 25 or 30 back on, like which is usually what happens when people go to the extreme approaches. So I'm not a huge fan of the extreme approach, but you know it can be done if needed. So... I mean, the best thing that I would recommend, Mr. YT, if you want, I mean, you can either just drop me an email, you know, at Lee H at Lee Hayward .com, And we can chat about your situation, what it is you're doing and see if we can come up with an action plan there. But, you know, because that's a very broad question, right? How do you drop 20 pounds? Well, I need to know what you're doing right now in order to really focus on how we can improve that. But I just want to address it that I'm, I'm not a big fan of the fast, quick fix solution. I would be much into working more sustainable habit and lifestyle changes where the weight comes off slower, but the weight you lose is the weight you can keep off and sustain as a lifestyle. And usually the slower, more gradual changes is the way to do that versus going to the extreme. And, you know, generally speaking, the fastest way to make a rapid weight loss would be some sort of extreme calorie restriction and usually some extreme carbohydrate restriction because that would literally drop the weight fastest. It's not necessarily quality weight. It's not necessarily going to help your fitness and athletic performance, but it would literally drop the weight on the scale. That's the fastest way because if you cut your carbohydrates and you deplete your glycogen stores, you're going to lose a lot of weight because when every for every gram of stored glycogen, which is carbohydrates that are stored into the cells, for every gram of stored glycogen, you retain three to four grams of water. So when you see people go on a low-carb diet, you know, whether it's a keto diet or a carnivore diet or some variation of that, they drop a lot of weight quickly because they're literally just depleting the muscle cells of glycogen. It's almost like letting the air out of a balloon. You deplete the glycogen and you just deflate the muscles and yet the weight drops quickly. And this, it gives people a false sense of hope because they see the scale dropping. And if you're only looking at the scale, you're like, maybe you drop 10 pounds in the first week of going low carb and you're like, whoa, I lost 10 pounds a week. This is amazing. But as soon as you replace those carbs, if you re, whether you go on a you know a high carb diet again or you have a cheat meal or something like that, you're going to quickly regain all that lost weight. So it's it's not a sustainable approach, and it's not body fat. It's literally just water manipulation. So if we're looking for pure fat loss, it has to happen at a slower, more steadier rate, right? But again, if, if you want some help with that, feel free to reach out to me. And again, my email address is leeh at leehayward.com. I should have it down in the description below as well. And, uh, you know, we can chat about some strategies if you want to go the extreme route. But I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of it personally. Got Trevor joining in. 
Uh, this is what Rob's joining in. It says, I have your app, and I was wondering what would be a good program for a guy looking to lose weight that's overweight, love to lift, and have about three to five days to work out. Uh, there's there's several programs within the app itself, but there's some good ones right on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel as well. And there's one that I would recommend um, if, if you're fairly new to working out or you're coming back to the gym after a layoff is some sort of beginner program. And I have a few of them. And I, I don't want you to take the term beginner program the wrong way because a lot of people think if it's a beginner program, then it's not going to work effectively or I'm too advanced for a beginner's program or whatever. Like I still follow quote unquote beginner programs because I enjoy the simplicity and they're effective. And, and it's not the program, meaning like the exercises, the sets, the reps, you know, how many days a week at time. That's not what determines whether the workout is effective or not. It's how much effort and consistency you put into that program. I mean, you could have a very complex program, but if you're not consistent, you don't put a lot of effort into it, it ain't going to work. Or vice versa, you could have a very simple program. And if you're consistent and you work that program, you can make phenomenal progress with it. So it's not always the complex program that works the best. A lot of times it's the complete opposite. A simple program that's done consistently and done in a progressive overload fashion can very often outproduce the most complex program that's done inconsistently. So there's a few... Uh, programs that I have there. There's one, if you go through the playlists, uh, there's a father and son uh, workout program. That's one that I'm a big fan of. And that's basically what I follow now is that style of training where it's three total body workouts a week. I'm a big fan of that. And I find it works well. Uh, there's a couple other ones. There's a husband and wife get back in shape program that we did there. Um, after the COVID lockdown, my wife and I did that and made a video series. Again, that's another three day per week program you can follow along with. But one of those, that's what I'd recommend, three days a week and alternate weight training one day and cardio the next. So with your three days of weight training, you know, that could be like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, whatever. I mean, it's just three non-consecutive days. And then on your off days, try to get in some, some form of cardio, whether that's just getting outside and going for a walk, whether that's going to the gym, using the cardio machines. If you have some sort of cardio at home, you can utilize that. But Cardio one day, weight training the next. And this is what I refer to as my yin and yang training method because you're alternating the high intensity weight training one day and then the low intensity cardio the next. And it's a great way to reap the benefits of daily exercise, keep your metabolism elevated, burn a lot of calories, but you're working within your body's recovery abilities. Because when you're doing the lower intensity cardio days, that serves as active recovery from the weight training. So the weight training is breaking down the muscle tissue. It's placing stress and demands on the joints, tendons, and ligaments. Whereas the low intensity cardio days, that's active recovery. You know, it's, it's not breaking your body down, but it's helping to build it back up. But at the same time, you're, you're getting the, the fat burning benefits and the metabolic benefits of regular exercise. And that's what I do personally. That's how I structure my workouts. Weight training one day, cardio the next, and it works really well. So that's what I would recommend as far as a program for someone who's overweight and looking to get back in shape or just achieve a body recomposition. And of course, the big thing that's going to really make or break your progress with that, Rob, is the nutrition, right? The nutrition that you follow it up with is going to, like the old saying, you can't out-train a poor diet. And that is so true. So, I mean, get the diet, or get the training in place first, but once that's in place, you really need to follow it up with a solid nutrition plan. And that can literally be the the thing that makes or breaks your progress for that. And if, of course, if you want some help with that, feel free to reach out to me. You know, I can got some resources that I can share with you. And over on my website, leehayward.com, there's some free PDF downloads that you can get. There's one called Ripped After 40. That's a, a PDF download that I put together outlining the system that I utilize to get back in shape after 40, after, after my son was born to get rid of the dad bod, basically outlines the muscle after 40 blueprint and how that works. So you, you might want to download that one. And there's also a program called Bodybuilding Nutrition Made Simple, which goes into more specific detail about how to go about uh, structuring your, your nutrition to optimize lean muscle gains and fat burning. So again, check the two of those out and they're available right on over on my website, leehayward.com. Just head on over there. And if, if you're on your computer, if you're on a desktop or, or tablet, you should see it in the side menu bar. If you're on a mobile device, your phone, you'll have to scroll to the bottom of the page and then you'll see all the links for those PDF downloads. 
All right, moving on. What else we got there? AJ is joining in. It says, Lee, uh, I have more of a business question here. What advice would you give someone wanting to sell a digital course regarding fitness and how would one go about it? Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> that's a cabin of worms. Um, but you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm totally cool with answering it. And I've been around the fitness industry for a long time and things have changed, right? Things have changed a lot in the fitness industry. So back in the early days when I started, like if I really go back, back, you know, to the late nineties, when I started my first website in 97, it was the wild, wild west. Like there was nothing out there. Right. So, I mean, it was, it was, I mean, you couldn't even accept credit cards online or anything like that. Like, so there were the online business was very crude to say the least, right? It was just plain HTML websites. There was no social media. There was no videos or none of that stuff. I mean, it was just a plain HTML website with some text and images and email communication back and forth. Like that was pretty much it. It was very crude. Uh, and then, you know, things just escalated from there. But as far as digital courses and stuff, I mean, that's how I did the bulk of my business for years, right? Selling digital programs like the Blast Your Bench program, the Blast Your Biceps program, the 21 Day Fast Mass Building program, the Biogenetic Weight Gain System. And I had a bodybuilding competition program and numerous other programs and courses that I've had over the years. There was other fat cutting programs and muscle building programs that I had. And plus I also partnered up with other people and helped to promote other digital programs. So, I mean, that was the bulk of my business for years was basically selling digital courses. And it was more or less PDF eBooks and maybe a membership site or something along those lines. But we did that for years and it was quite lucrative in the early days. And the reason for that, uh, obviously, there was less competition and less, less uh, the, the market wasn't saturated with content like it is today. And it was more easy to sell programs like that. And we could sell them at a higher price point, like from a, uh, a, a money and profit point of view, like the common price point for a lot of these digital courses and eBooks was usually around $47. I mean, if you've been around the online scene, scene for a long time, you've probably seen a lot of people selling their build muscle, burn fat program. And it was some sort of $47 program. Now, I mean, people would experiment with different price points, but that was kind of like the general rule of thumb. So, I mean, basically you're selling a, a, a digital download, which once the system is in place and the website and everything else is created, it was it was like free money. <laughs> like that's what it was because the expense was in the marketing and the tech setup and everything else. But once it was in place, like the, it didn't matter if you sold one copy or a thousand copies, the the delivery was pretty much the same. I mean, there were there is some minor expenses with bandwidth and all that stuff, but when you're looking at the bigger picture, it was you know you, you could really scale that to a large degree and it was high profit points for sure. But that didn't last for forever. Like that kind of really peaked out around the the 2010-ish, 2011, like in, in that kind of range, you know, 10 years ago, those that that's when the the peak of those digital courses. And then it just started to get more saturated. Like pe like every Tom, Dick, and Harry had a muscle building program that they were selling. And now when it comes to selling digital courses online like that, it's almost like a race to the bottom. And what I mean by that is everybody is undercutting one another. And the way it is with these courses now is a lot of people are not actually making money from the courses because like they're, people are, are actually trying to either give them away or sell them at such a low price point to just create volume. And there's it's, it's not as lucrative or as profitable as it used to be. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you can't make it work, but it's not as good as it used to be. So how I've switched my business model over the years is I don't really focus on selling digital courses anymore. I focus more on the the one on one coaching. And that's what I do. So instead of just giving someone a PDF download or another workout program, which let's be honest, we don't need another workout program. We don't need another PDF download or a, a meal plan because I can go on Google right now and I can type in workout program and I'll get a billion search results. I can type in what's the best diet plan and I'll get a billion search results. I can go on YouTube and everything is there. 
right? Stuff that we had to pay for back in the day is all there for free. Like there's there's no shortage of information and courses and 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 content. We have more content than we can absorb. <laughs> it's information overload. What people want now, I find, is they want personal guidance and not just getting another program or more content, but they want someone to literally take them by the hand and show them how to go through this process step by step. So it, it like it's like take them like clutter, like declutter the whole process and say like, look, you don't need a million different programs. This is what you need based on where you are, your goals, your situation, your lifestyle, everything else. And we kind of like, instead of giving them more, I'm taking away and we focus on less. So that's what I do these days. I don't focus on digital courses and all that kind of stuff. It's that one-on-one -on -one interaction. And I find when it comes to fitness, that's what most people need. They don't need another workout. They don't need another diet. They need a coach. They need accountability. And they need someone who can actually take them through the process, who's done it themselves and has helped other people do it and can help them do it as well. And that's what I focus on. So my model has changed a lot. And, you know, that's that's my advice when it comes to the digital courses. So I've, I've literally gotten out of that business model myself because I found it's just oversaturated at this point. Now, with that being said, if you have a fantastic course and everything else, you, you probably can still make it work. But it's it's a very competitive marketplace. Let's put it that way. Right. It's 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 not like it used to be a decade ago or even earlier than that, you know, 15 plus years ago, it's, it's changed a lot and you're, you're going up against a lot of competition, right? So just, just be prepared for it. Again, I'm not trying to be disheartening or, or dampen your sails or damp, you know, dampen your spirits, if you will take the wind out of your sails, but I'm just trying to give you a dose of reality. Like it's, it's an uphill battle for sure. Right. But still there's, there's going to be people do it, but I'm just giving you, giving you a heads up. If you're going down that road, you, you got to have some unique features. It just can't be another eat right and exercise program, <laughs> right? People can get enough eat right and exercise content for free on Google and YouTube and everywhere else, right? It's got to be something pretty darn unique, you know, in order to uh, to stand out from the, the crowd. So that's my two cents worth or, or more, if you will. All right, let's move on. Yeah, give myself a cup of tea here now. I'm getting to the bottom of the cup here now, but we'll have our tea with Lee video chat. That's what I always say if I got myself a cup of tea. Uh, we have J.E. joining in, says, I'm starting a new full body program and would like your opinion. Monday, 5x5, five five, Wednesday, 4x10, Friday, 3x20. All right. I, I like that, how you're working different rep ranges. So you're getting basically more of the power strength and power ranges on the uh the, the five by five you're getting more into the hypertrophy range when you're doing sets of 10 and more into the higher repetition muscular endurance higher volume with your sets of 20. i i like that i i really do and i've utilized similar approaches myself where we've varied the rep ranges you know low rep medium rep high rep and that is a, a solid program the best thing to do is literally Try it out and see how your body responds. Like th that's one of the things when it comes to workout programs and creating plans. Like you can have a good plan on paper, but you really don't know how it's going to work until you put it into practice. Right? And then this is something that I teach my coaching students all the time. And I always say, like, you know, when we're we're designing a customized training and nutrition program for somebody, I say this is like a business plan. It's like you pretend you and I were going into business together, right? So we're going to sit down together and we're going to lay out a business plan on paper. I mean, it might look good on paper, but until we actually go into business, right, and deal with the real world and real world challenges and everything else, we don't know how good it is or how it's going to work or not. And there's always going to be challenges and things pop up that you never planned for when you were putting it together on paper. So use that as, as the template, the starting point right? The, the rough draft, if you will, but put it into practice, see how your body responds and be open to feedback and modification as you go, right? I mean, you may need to modify some of the exercises, uh, some of the set and rep patterns. And for, for, for that workout, certain exercises work really well for heavy, low rep sets for like a five by five program. Other exercises work well for higher reps. And then other exercises work well for me, me, 
mid-range reps, but not all exercises work well for all different rep ranges. Like you would never train your abs with five by five, right? Or like you wouldn't do calf raises with five by five for the most part, or, you know, isolation moves like side lateral raises and stuff like that. Whereas five by five works really good for like the big three power lifts, you know, your squat bench and deadlift, uh, you know, overhead presses and rows and things like that. You know, the big compound lifts work well for five by five. Uh, I find isolation work that tends to respond better into the higher rep ranges. And then of course, you know, a lot of the bulk of your workouts are going to work well into that mid range hypertrophy rep range, you know, in that eight to 12 range, if you will. So just keep that in mind as well. Not all exercises are going to fit into that template. So be flexible, right? I mean, if, if you're not getting a good muscle stimulation with a five by five for maybe an isolation exercise, like, hey, bump it up to a higher rep range or change it around so that you're doing that on the days that you do your higher reps or whatever, however you're structuring this workout. But just be aware of that, right? And if, if you want to kind of get a good idea of how different uh, exercises respond to different rep patterns. Or, uh, I put together a blog post and a video, uh, how many reps to build muscle. So if you just go to Google or go to YouTube and search for like Lee Hayward, how many reps to build muscle, you should find that. It's, it's an older blog post and an older video, one that I made over 10 years ago. I can't remember exactly when it was, but it's an older one. But I literally break down and say like, these are exercises that are good for heavy low reps. These are exercises that are good for the hypertrophy mid-range reps. And these are exercises that are good for the higher reps. And kind of give you a general overview. All right, so that's uh, something that you might want to review and incorporate into your program. All right, moving on. What else we got here? We have Pierce, I believe it is. Or if I think that's how I pronounce it. Pierce is joining and he says, I'm having issues with my rotator cuff. Any type of overhead pressing kills my shoulder. Is there any, any type of exercises I can do to help fix that? There are some rotator cuff rehab exercises you can do and actually have some videos covering different rotator cuff rehab exercises. And there's a lot of them on YouTube. There's no shortage. Like obviously you can search for like Lee Hayward rotator cuff and you'll see all my videos, but you know, be open to watching other videos as well. Like I'm not trying to claim to have it all the answers here. Like there's a ton of rehab exercise videos for rotator cuff. But the thing that I wanted to address here is you don't have to do overhead pressing exercises if they bother your shoulders. Like you can still train the shoulders with isolation work and avoid the presses altogether. Like side lateral raises, front raises, reverse flies, um, shrugs. Like with that, those moves right there, like you will hit all the major muscles of your shoulders, right? You'll hit the front delts, side delts, rear delts, and the traps. You know, so you can still work the shoulders without doing a direct overhead press. So if the overhead press hurts, causes pain, discomfort, you can't do it, like don't don't let that, you know, throw you off. Just work around it, right? Focus on working the muscles, not getting hung up on the specific movement pattern. I mean, unless you're doing a sport, say like Olympic weightlifting, where you have to press overhead, <laughs> then you don't have to do overhead presses. If you're just training to build your body and improve your overall health and fitness, you know, you don't have to do any exercise, it's, meaning like you don't have to do any specific exercise. You just have to focus on working the muscle and the, and train it that way. So find the exercises that you can do and go from there. All right. We have Neil joining in. Says, I changed my workout this week. Uh, is this the same one again or not? Or, you know, I'm just double checking here now. Uh no, that was J.E. OK, it, 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 the, the almost looked like a similar question. So that's why I was thinking, did I already answer this? But no, I didn't. OK, Neil says, I changed my workout this week from six by six short rest periods, 20 seconds to a standard straight sets, three by six with one to two minutes of rest. And I can lift more weight and I'm hitting new PRs. Not sure how this happened, but I'll take it. Um, that makes perfect sense. And the big thing is the rest periods you're allowing yourself between sets. When you're taking short rest periods, 20 seconds, like that's not full recovery by any stretch. Like you're still, your muscles still have lactic acid and fatigue and everything else. Like you're not fully recovered. Your, your energy systems, your ATP, 
uh, hasn't fully regenerated. So you're training in a fatigue state. When you're ha having those short rest periods, like you're always pre-fatigued going into the next set. So your strength is limited. Now, that there's pros and cons to that. Don't get me wrong, because that does help build up conditioning and muscular endurance and all that kind of stuff. So it helps uh, in that sense. But when you switch to taking longer rest periods, like upwards of two minutes, now your body is able to regenerate its its energy, you know, your ATP energy, which is the energy system that gets rejuvenated when you supplement with creatine. It helps the, the adenosine triphosphate. That's the energy system that's utilized for high intensity, short duration exercise, like weightlifting. So when you allow more time, your body has a chance to regenerate that energy system and you get to recover, you get to catch your breath between sets and you can power out more weight, more reps, like you will feel stronger. And it's, it's not always necessarily due to gaining more. It's just that you're allowing your body to maximize the strength that you currently have. Whereas when you're training with very short rest periods, you're always in that pre-fatigue state and you're not able to maximize your full strength potential. But again, there, there's pros and cons to both styles of training. And it's good that you're mixing it up like that. So with this current approach, I mean, ride it out. Ride it out for as long as you're seeing progress, for as long as you enjoy it. And then maybe for your next training phase, you can go back to doing some of these uh, shorter rest break workouts. Like um, to, to kind of really get a good idea of how this works, uh, one of the programs that I had, it's still available now, Blast Your Bench. Uh, the Blast Your Bench program really breaks this down into detail. And that's one of the reasons why it works so effectively is because there's not only are we manipulating the workouts, the exercises, the sets and reps, but we're also manipulating the rest intervals between those sets. And we go through training phases where we take very short rest periods, phases where we take medium rest periods, and then phases where we take long rest periods. And you'd be amazed, even if you did the exact same workout, but you just vary the rest interval in between sets, that can have a dramatic impact on your strength and energy levels and how much strength you're able to generate, and also what energy systems are being utilized during that workout. So the shorter rest periods, right? you're not getting into the maximum power. You're into more muscular endurance and conditioning, more of that lactic acid energy system. Whereas when you take the longer rest periods, now you're actually getting into that ATP energy system where you can maximize your strength and power output. And you will see massive differences just by manipulating the rest intervals. And this is something that... Most people in the gym don't strictly follow. And I'll be honest, like when I'm doing my general workouts, I don't strictly time my rest between sets. But sometimes when I'm following a specific program, such as the Blaster Bench program, I will literally have the stopwatch, you know, and, and train specific to that. Uh, other programs that I use that were strict with rest period intervals, um, the West Side Barbell program. Um, you know, the, using their template where they were doing the dynamic effort workouts, they had very strict rest intervals between sets where you're doing multiple sets and very short rest breaks in between those sets, you know, to kind of build into that fatigue training zone. But yeah, that, that makes perfect sense of why you're seeing the strength gains with the longer rest breaks. All right, moving on. Uh, Andrew's saying, this is not fitness related, but do you still have the Honda Civic race car? He said, I've seen it in the ghouls a few times. No, I do not. I sold that. I sold that earlier this summer. Uh, there was a guy from Cornerbrook bought it, and he's actually racing it in their autocross club out on the West Coast. So I've sold that. And the reason I did is because I just wasn't using it. Like, you know, obviously during the pandemic, everything kind of got shut down, including Targa and autocross and everything else. And for those of you who are wondering what I'm talking about, you know, I used to be an amateur race car driver. So I did Targa, which is a road rally race, did autocross. And I also did some track racing down at Spring Mountain Motorsports in Nevada. So I did that for several years. And that was a, a passion of mine for a while. And I had a Honda Civic race car, rally car. I mean, it was all decked out, roll cage, you know, race ready. And I had that for several years, but I sold it this summer because it wasn't, it's not a priority for me anymore. Like I didn't go, I haven't used it in a few years. And I said, you know, it's just sitting in the garage there collecting dust. I'm not going to use it. And I said, you know, let's pass it on to somebody else. So I sold all my race gear this summer and uh, glad that they did. Right. So somebody else is using it now and benefiting from it. Yeah, there. 
Uh, Zeem is joining in. Uh, cases. Azim's got a question there. He says, Lee, cardio and gym on the same day or alternate days, which is correct or better? Well, it's not necessarily right or wrong, good or bad. <laughs> it depends on you, your schedule, what it is you're training for and all that kind of stuff. I personally like alternating days of cardio and strength training because they're using different energy systems. It's a different form of stimulation. And as I mentioned in one of our earlier Q and A's up there, uh, it was, uh, I recommend the alternating weight training one day and cardio the next. That's what I do personally, right? So, I mean, I will go to the gym, do my strength training workouts, and then the next day I'm going to focus on the cardio training. And I like that approach because, one, it gives you a lot of mental variety, right? Because you two different styles of exercise. And it also gives you physical variety. So the strength training, that's placing stress and demands on the muscles, the joints, the tendons, and ligaments, the cardio that's working, you know, your cardiovascular system. And it's it's not placing the same stress on the body. So I like the alternating cardio and weight training. However, if you're pressed for time and you don't have the luxury of being able to do cardio and weights on a, alternate days and you need to kind of combine it all together, you can do that. And I've done that as well. And very often, like when I'm getting ready for bodybuilding competitions, I would do that. I would combine cardio and weight training together in the same workout. And if you are going to do it together in the same workout, I generally recommend start with the weight training first. I mean, you can do a, a short cardio warm up, like say 10 minutes of cardio as a general overall warm up, just to get the core temperature elevated and get a light sweat going, prepare your body for the workout. But then focus on the strength training, get that done. And then if you want to finish it off, then do the cardio afterwards. And this is if your main goal is muscle building and fat loss, right? I would recommend doing that. If your main goal is cardiovascular fitness and sports performance, then you might want to reverse it. But I know for a lot of people, probably the majority of people tuning into this video chat right now, building muscle is probably one of the top priorities. Losing body fat is a second priority. And cardiovascular fitness and sports performance is probably lower on the priority rank unless you're an athlete who's training for that specifically. So that's how I'd recommend it for the majority of people is do the weight training first and then the cardio afterwards. And the reason for that is because you'll still have maximum strength for your weight training, you know, get, get a good workout done. And then afterwards you can really tap into burning stored body fat because you've depleted your glycogen to a degree through the weight training workouts. And then when you do that cardio afterwards, you can really help to tap into some burn and stored body fat. And most people, when they combine weight training and cardio together, the cardio is a lower intensity cardio session. So you're not pushing, you know, you're, you're not hitting your VO2 max or anything like that during that cardio session. You're basically just, you know, low intensity, higher volume. That's what you're going for. So that's how I would recommend it if you are doing it in the same session. But if possible, break it up on different days. Uh, let's see what else we got there. The burning element is joining in. <laughs> says, Lee, is it okay to work out every day, several times a day? I've been doing it since I was 15. <sighs> I mean, there's worse habits you could have, <laughs> right? Working out every day is not a bad habit. Uh, several times a day. This, this is an individual thing because there's so many variables there. I mean, like if you look at advanced athletes, a lot of those will train every day, several times a day. But how they're training it's still working within their body's recovery abilities. So it's not like I'm going doing max effort workouts every single day, several times a day. Like you can only push yourself so much before you hit your breaking point and you start to overtrain and things break down and they don't recover. So you got to look at the bigger picture. I mean, if I were to do everyday workouts, which I, I pretty much do, I alternate weight training one day and cardio the next. So that way I'm alternating the form of training stimulation that I'm getting, but I'm still exercising every day. And if I were to add in more than that, then I would probably focus on adding in extra types of workouts, which is still workouts, but it's not breaking the body down. It's more like active recovery or mobility work. So you could probably do, I'm thinking like in, a, in an athlete's point of view, they may have a weight training workout in the morning and they may have a practice where they're working on their game skills or their technical skills in the afternoon. I mean, that's technically two workouts, but it's two totally different forms of stimulation, right? One is pure physical strength power through the weight training workout. 
the the game practice is more technical skills. So it's not the same degree of stress on the body. Uh, another way you could look at it is maybe you could do the weight training in the you know, for one of the workouts and then maybe do some low intensity cardio for another workout. That's another way where you could work out more than once a day and still have it complement. Or you could do a weight training workout and then do some stretching and mobility work later in the day. So yes, you can work out multiple times a day and you could literally work out every day, but you got to structure it in such a way that you're recovering from it. Because that's the key here is recovery. Like working out without recovery is not progress. Like if, if you're just working out and you're breaking your body down and then you're working out and you're breaking your body down, but you never let it to rest, recover and grow in between, then you're not making progress. It's like digging a hole and you're just digging yourself into a rut. Like you're, you're not getting any further ahead. You're just constantly breaking it down. And then this is what happens with overtraining, which is a real thing, especially for young people. Right? And, and um, you mentioned you've been doing it since you were 15. Well, a lot of young people do this for a couple of reasons. And I was guilty of this back when I was a teenager as well, because one, I had a ton of time on my hands. I mean, when you're a teenager, you got no responsibilities, right? I mean, like go to school, that, that's your responsibility. But like, you don't have a job, you don't have a family to raise or anything like that. So there's a lot of time on your hands. So I use that time for working out. And I, I pretty much worked out every day. And, and, and you can kind of get away with it because one, you got youth on your side, you know, your, your hormones are at their highest. The body recovers faster from, from stimulus and injury and all that kind of stuff. So you can get away with it to a degree, but you can still push the overtraining boundaries even if you're younger. The older you get, the less forgiving your body is. So a lot of guys, especially when you're 40 plus, you're not going to be able to work out every day several times a day and recover from it. In fact, for a lot of guys, three to four workouts a week is probably pushing it. You know, that's kind of maxing out the recovery. And again, it's an individual thing because we all have different levels of work capacity, different levels of fitness. So if someone's really advanced, they may be able to handle those higher volume and higher frequency workouts. Uh, for someone who's just getting started, I'd keep it simple, you know, literally three days a week or something like that. Just start with a basic program. So hopefully this helps to elaborate on it because a lot of these questions, there's no set answer. It depends. It depends on the individual, their situation, their fitness experience, all that kind of stuff, what it is they're training for. So, you know, I, I go into a lot of detail when I answer these because I want to kind of share the bigger picture and not just give you, oh, do it this way. Everybody should work out every day. Like, no, right? Like, it depends. All right. Rob is saying, thanks for the answer. You're more than welcome, my friend. Um, Stephen is asking, what's my, in my opinion, what's a better source of carbohydrates, rice or pasta? I would, if I had to choose one or the other, and I choose both, right? I mean, like I, I have no problems with digesting pasta and wheat products. Like I don't have any gluten and sens sensitivities or whatever, so I can have both. But if you have any gluten sensitivity, then rice would be the better option because it has no gluten. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, like, what the heck is gluten anyway? Because you hear it all the time, right? You know, people say, hey, avoid gluten or gluten-free this or gluten-free that. Gluten is wheat protein. That's all it is. It's the protein in wheat products. So bread, pasta, cereals, a lot of whole grains and whatever, like the, the grain products, your bread, your your pastas and, and, and processed wheat products, they contain gluten. And if they're gluten-free, then there's some sort of modified product. So it might be pasta, but it's not made with wheat. It's made with some sort of rice or, or whatever. It's, it's got some different combination. So you will see that from time to time. But if you do have any intolerances, rice would probably be the better option. And rice is a more unprocessed carbohydrate, right? Pasta is a processed carbohydrate more so than rice. But from a practical point of view, as long as there's no digestive issues, 50 grams of carbohydrates from pasta is, is pretty much going to be the same as 50 grams of carbohydrates from rice. Like it's, it's the volume, not so much the source, right? I mean, both are, are a complex starchy carbohydrate. Both are going to give you energy. Both are going to refill your glycogen stores. Like there's not a lot of difference. It's really personal preference and what your body uh, responds and digests better. So if, if you do have any digestive issues, then I would choose the less processed options. And even there, I would probably shoot for 
for anyone with digestive issues, potatoes, sweet potatoes, you know, <laughs> fruits and vegetables, more of those lines of, of carbohydrates, even more so than the rice or the pasta. But again, it's, it's the volume of carbohydrates is the big thing that you want to look at. Not so much the source, as long as it is a, a good source. Now, I mean, 50 grams of carbohydrates from rice or pasta is not the same as 50 grams of carbohydrates from, you know, like <laughs> candy or, 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 or chocolate chips or something like that. Like you want to have similar categories of carbohydrates. Like think of your complex carbohydrates, your starchy carbohydrates, your fibrous carbohydrates, things like that. Like rice and pastas, you know, they're pretty much on par as far as, you know, the effectiveness in your body. Uh, next question from current news is the, is the username it says, how is the combination of Monday and ch Monday chest and shoulder with 20 minutes of cardio Tuesday, legs and abs Wednesday, back and biceps and triceps with 20 minutes of cardio after workout repeat, you know, you, you can make any workout split work, right? Like, uh, the, the main thing is, is following it and following it consistently. Um, Right. And so, I mean, you, what you have outlined there, it's basically, it's kind of like a push, pull legs, modified split, if you will. Um, if, if you, again, you can certainly make that work. If, if you had more time, like another day, I would probably split it up a little more. Like I I've done this in the past where I had like a, a chest dominated day, back dominated day, leg dominated day, and then usually like an arm and shoulder day or something like that. I found that that's worked well. You, I mean, if, if you wanted to, you can separate shoulders and arms with their own respective days as well. But the the, the split, it, it's it, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is you being consistent with those workouts and what you actually do during those workouts. So I, I get this question a lot. Like there's some people, they keep messaging me and commenting to my videos and stuff like, hey, what do you think of this split? What do you think of that split? Like, should I do push pull legs? Should I do this? And, and you can make gains with any workout split, right? It's not the order of exercises or the order of body parts. Like there's no magic secret. Like everyone thinks, you know, well, should I do chest on day one or should I do back on day one or should I do legs on day one or, you know, it should be chest, back, legs or should it be legs, back, chest or like, it doesn't matter. It's what you actually do during those workouts, the effort you put into it, whether you're training with progressive overload and actually, you know, pushing your body beyond what it can do. And then the consistency, right? It's it's pushing the limits, you know, so you're stimulating muscle growth and then allowing it to rest, recover, and grow, and then get back in there again and stimulate it all over again. And th there's no right or wrong answer to this. Like to kind of put an analogy out there, like let's say we're looking at, hey, what's the best way to make money? You know, and someone might say, well, the best way to make money is the stock market. And then someone else might say the best way to make money is through real estate. And someone else might say the best way to make money is have your own business. And someone else will say the best way to make money is to, you know, work in a, some fancy job or whatever. Like they all work. <laughs> like these are all methods of making money. It's what works the best for you. What do you actually enjoy doing and what are you going to be able to do consistently? That's what you need to look at. Right. They all work. So like when it comes to the workout splits, you know, we can have a chest, shoulders, day one and the legs and the abs and day two and a back and the biceps day three. And a, like it all works. It's what you're actually doing during those workouts and then how hard you're pushing yourself with progressive overload. And then again, allowing the, for the rest and the recovery process. And the big one that, that makes or breaks all this is what are you fueling it with? Like the nutrition plan that's backing up that workout, right? I mean, like we could have a high performance sports car, but if we don't got the right fuel to go in it, I mean, it ain't going to operate at its best. So the, the nutrition that you back up your workouts with can have just as big of an impact, if not bigger than the actual workout itself. So hopefully that helps clarify that, but Hey, what you got there, give it a go. Try it. Let's see. Uh, we have Troy just, uh, sponsored the chat much of pre or not Troy. Sorry. I mixed up. I said Troy is Tony. Tony's sponsored the video chat. Thank you, Tony, for your support. Much appreciated. And he said, what are your thoughts on the strong lifts program for building muscle? The five by five plan. Um, I've the, the five by five program. I mean, it's got a lot of positive feedback. And if you're a, an intermediate lifter, you know, you're, you're B 
beyond the beginner phase. I think a, a strong lifts program using the five by five method is certainly good, a good one to use. I've done various different five by five programs. Um, one that I've followed for a while back in the day was a uh, bill stars five by five. He was probably one of the original guys who came up with the five by five, like the old school. And I know the strong lifts program is very similar to that as well, but there's a lot of different five by five type of programs out there and they definitely do work right they're they're good for just building a good solid foundation focusing on strength and power and hypertrophy and if you're uh, an intermediate lifter so that you're comfortable with those barbell lifts and that you're comfortable with the lower rep ranges by all means go for it um but the problem is you're mentioned there for a newbie like what how new is new <laughs> right and again the, the definition of this is is all over the place right like what people consider newbie so if you've never stepped foot inside a gym before and you're like walking in deers in the headlight like what the hell do i do no you don't do strong lifts five by five right you start off with the bare bones basically you get one of the the trainers or coaches at the gym to take you on an orientation show you around you start with some basic machine exercises and just learn how to actually work out right five by five is is several months down the road from that like you need to have a, a decent foundation first and when i'm coaching somebody new i always recommend starting with machine exercises for the majority of the workouts for a few reasons one machines are, are easy to learn because the weight is supported along the machine you know it's on a guided path whether it's you know, the, a weight stack machine or a Smith machine or something along those lines, like the, the weight is supported for you. And you just got to focus on pushing and pulling against the resistance, right? So you, you can get the mind muscle connection. You can kind of get in the groove of the exercise, learn, you know, the different sets and rep patterns and how they feel without balancing and supporting weight or, you know, worrying about, oh, I'm going to lose my balance and screw up. Like the machine helps you so much. So it's great for laying that foundation. And then we can gradually start incorporating some free weight variations into that machine program. So like, for example, maybe we start off with a chest press. Once you're comfortable with that, maybe we can move on to a barbell bench press or a dumbbell press or something along those lines, or maybe even push-ups. you know, different variations of the same movement pattern. Same with, uh, you know, we'll start off maybe doing some uh, machine, uh, you know, like a, a machine uh, bicep curl, for example. Right. Once you're comfortable with that, then we can move over to a free weight bicep curl. But I always start with machines first for newbies. Just lay the foundation, get comfortable, just build the habit of being in the gym, get used to how it feels to work your muscles, you know, feel them getting sore and, and how long it takes them to rest, recover and grow afterwards. You know, get into that whole groove, build that foundation. And then once you've been doing that for several months, and again, it's, it's going to depend on the individual, but like somewhere about six months of solid training under your belt, then you'll probably be ready for something along the lines of a, a more advanced barbell program like the Strong Lifts 5x5. But it's not a newbie program, meaning like, hey, I'm day one, never been to the gym before. Where do we start? <laughs> we don't start with 5x5, five five, right? We start with the basics. So hopefully that helps. And again, if, if you want some specific help with this, uh, you know, like a recommendations of a program for you at the level you're at, feel free to reach out to me. Like drop me a line. Uh, my email address is leeh at leehayward.com. Or if you're on Facebook, friend me up over on Facebook. I, my name is Lee Hayward on Facebook, just facebook.com forward slash Lee dot Hayward. Uh, friend me up over on Facebook and we can chat through Messenger as well. And if you do friend me up over on Facebook, uh, send me a message and just say, hey, I follow your YouTube videos and I've decided to friend request you on Facebook. Like just kind of give me a bit of a background so I know who the heck you are. <laughs> Cause I, I get a lot of weird friend requests on Facebook. And if I don't, you know, if, if it's a sketchy or whatever, sometimes I just delete, delete. Cause there's a lot of, you know, trolls and frauds and crap out there, you know, people trying to sell in everything from Bitcoin to investment scams or whatever. So like, you know, I had one the other day, someone friend requested me and I just, started, I had no idea like who the hell this person is, but I did accept the friend request thinking maybe it's, you know, someone who follows my videos or someone who follows my fitness content. And the next thing, you know, he's trying to sell me some freaking pyramid scheme or whatever. I'm like, just delete block. <laughs> right. So if you are going to friend request me, 
you know, just send me a message and say, hey, I follow your videos or follow your live video chats. And I wanted to friend request you. So give me give me some context. So I'm not going to delete and block you. All right. Moving on. Um, we have. Uh, a H K. <laughs> Uh, AHK is joining in. He says, natural classic physique. Do you know about posing compared to open bodybuilding? Um, it's it's very similar. Like the, the classic physique poses are based around bodybuilding poses, right? There's not a whole lot of difference there. And this last year, last, uh, that was in July of 2021, I competed in classic physique. I made my comeback to the uh, master's bodybuilding stage. And that was the category that I chose. So I, I did that and it's, it's very similar. So the, the poses for classic physique, it's obviously standing relaxed and you do the quarter turns. Uh, but then it's, what is it? Front double bicep, side chest, back double bicep. And then I believe it's abdominal and thigh. And I think that's it. I th Front double bicep, back double bicep, side chest. Did, did I miss any? <laughs> Just, I'm, I'm brain farting. So yeah, front double bicep, side chest. Um, oh, and then your favorite classic pose. That's what I'm, I'm getting wrong there. Your favorite classic pose, which is basically just a, a freestyle pose. So that's it. So there, it's the same poses as in open bodybuilding, but just not all of them. So you're not doing the lat spreads and you're not doing the most musculars. That's basic. And you're not doing a side tricep, which I don't know why. Like, because in my opinion, a side tricep pose is a great classic physique pose. But for some reason, it's not part of the criteria for classic physique. Um, so those are your poses, you know, front and back, double bicep, side chest, abdominal and thigh, and your favorite classic pose, whichever one you happen to choose. And you could choose a side tricep for that one. I actually did for the pre-judging round. And then I chose a, a different one for the evening show, but you know, those are the basic poses. So what I recommend from a practice point of view, like if you're practicing, your posing for classic physique, still practice all the poses. Like still practice your lat spread, still practice your side triceps, still practice those poses, still practice your most muscular because, I mean, you can still use those in your posing routine. And it, it, I mean, it's, it's just going to help, but it builds the, the it builds the, um, the, the connection and, and the ability to control your physique better. So I'm a bigger fan of doing more poses than less. So, I mean, obviously you really want to practice the ones that are going to be called in competition, but when I ran through my posing practice, I still did all the major poses, like all the, the eight mandatory poses in bodybuilding, you know, just for the practice point of view and to build the control, right? The ability to control your physique and, to, you know, to highlight your strengths and hide your weaknesses and to control your breathing and all that stuff. So you want to focus on all of it. All right. What I recommend, and this is for anybody who's thinking about doing any type of physique competition, whether it is physique, classic physique, open bodybuilding or whatever, work with a coach to help you with your posing. And there's a, chances are like, you'll be able to find some people in your local area who do this, like just contact your, the federation that you're going to be competing in. And they'll probably be able to hook you up with a coach. If you don't know of anybody, you could even ask around at your local gym, especially a gym that, you know, there's other competitors train at, but get someone to work with you personally. And ideally someone who's got good competition background right? Who knows this stuff because the experience and the feedback that you'll get from working with a coach is invaluable. Now, if you're really stuck, there are people who will do it online, like through Zoom and Skype and stuff like that, but it's not quite the same as having somebody one-on-one. -on -one. And back when I was competing a lot, this was something that I did a lot as well was those one-on-one -on -one posing uh, consultations. So like anytime I was training someone who was getting ready for a bodybuilding show, like a local competitor, that was part of the program as at, at least once a week, we'd get together for one-on-one -on -one posing practice. And uh, that mean you can really fine tune things when you're working with a coach one-on-one. -on -one. So I would highly recommend it. It's, it would make a huge difference versus just trying to wing it and figure it out on your own. All right, we have Rob is joining in with the question saying starting back up after a layoff because of depression and was wondering how do you ease back into your fitness journey 
and increase the stamina back to a level as it was before the layoff. Well, I'm sorry to hear that you had to have a layoff. And of course, depression is not a, an easy topic to deal with. I mean, I, I have friends and family members who've went through it. So, I mean, I totally understand that it is a, a difficult situation for sure. But the simple answer, start small. Just like give yourself permission to take tiny action steps. Start small and build from there. And the thing you need to realize is when you're starting small, like feel good about the small victories. For example, if you show up to the gym, like celebrate the fact that you showed up to the gym. Like who cares what you did when you got there? Like the fact that you walked into the gym door, you made the commitment to show up to the gym, like celebrate that, feel good about that. Give yourself permission to feel good about that and treat that as a victory. Like that's a pat on the back. Good job. Hey. I got a win under my belt today. I showed up to the gym. Now, whatever the heck you do when you're in there, I really don't care. Like the main thing is build the habit of actually showing up. Like once you have that habit in place, then we can always build on it. But you can't build on something that's not established, right? You need to start with the basics. And like literally for, for people who are getting back on after a layoff, especially if you've had, you know, depression or anything like that, some emotional issues, that could be a big mental block, like literally just showing up to the gym. So maybe for your first month, you say, you know what, I'm going to just go to the gym and I'm going to walk on the treadmill for 10 minutes and leave. Like maybe that is, is your goal and you just make a habit every day. Hey, I'm just going to show up to the gym, walk on the treadmill for 10 minutes and leave and build that consistency. And I mean, I know it sounds so stupid. People say, well, what kind of gains are you going to make walking on the treadmill? Like, it's not about that. It's about building the habit. Like build a habit first. Once the habit is in place, we can always expand on it. But if you don't have the habits in place, I mean, it doesn't matter what workout split you got planned out and everything else. Like if you can't follow it consistently, it's useless. So you need to build a habit of consistency. And to help you with this, there's a really good book that I'd recommend you get. It's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I love this book because it goes into building habits and Atomic habits, it's all about building small habits because, you know, an atom, atomic, that's where he comes up with the word atomic habits. An atom is, you know, the smallest particle, molecule, whatever you want to call it. So start small. That's that's the premise of the book and then build from there. And the, the thing I really like about that book as well is it uses a lot of real world diet and exercise examples in the book itself. So, I mean, like you could literally follow that book and there will be tons of suggestions that you could be starting with right away. So if you're looking for a book recommendation, I highly recommend that. Um, I mean, I got the hard copy book. I also got it on Audible, right? I like both, right? Because I find, you know, both methods, the reading as well as the listening, you learn it in, in two forms, right? The visual and the auditory just helps you to absorb it at a deeper level. But get one, right? If you got an Audible account, download the ebook or the, the Audible book. And, uh, you know, if, if you want to really take it to the next level, get the hard copy as well. But that book is a, is a game changer, right? I mean, anybody, regardless of where you're at in your fitness journey or, or whatever it is, I would recommend that as a must read. I think that's a fantastic book. And I've certainly gotten a lot out of it. And it's one that I keep going back to, reading and rereading over again. And in that book, James actually shares an example of someone who had was overweight and started working out and lost over 100 pounds. And that's how they started their fitness journey was building the habit of just showing up to the gym. And I think in, it was very similar to what I just said there. Like he's, he set the goal, like for the first month, that's all he did. Let's just show up to the gym. I think he worked out for five minutes, whatever, did cardio or whatever the hell he did for five minutes and then left again. And he actually made himself do that. Like he made himself commit to showing up and then leaving, showing up and leaving just to build the discipline right? The discipline of being able to show up and the discipline to be able to leave. Because <laughs> a lot of times, once we get there, you may not want to leave, right? <laughs> so like he built discipline both ways. And then after he did that for a month and he was like consistent and like this was like, after you do it for a month, like this is going to be part of your routine. Like, okay, going to the gym, I'm going to do it. And then he's like, okay, well now that I'm here, I might as well do something. So the workouts gradually built and he expanded on them and added exercises and volume. So he's actually starting to do a proper workout when he showed up to the gym. But step one is to build the habit of just getting your ass to the gym. Like that is so important. 
And I mean, I can't under or overestimate or overemphasize this because I talk to so many people who know all the best workout splits. Like they're on YouTube watching all the fitness influencers. They're reading all the books and magazines and watching all the videos. Like they've been around the fitness game for so long. So they know all the push pull legs and the five by fives and they know all the workout splits and they know about all the supplements, you know, taking your protein and your creatine and your, your EAAs and your omega threes. And like, they, they know everything. They know it all. They know more than most certified personal trainers, but they're doing jack shit. <laughs> Like they know it up here, but in what they're actually doing is nothing. And then they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm too busy. I'll start again on Monday or whatever. And they're all, like always procrastinating because they can't get themselves to act on what they know. So like, I don't care how much, you know, it, it means nothing. It's how much you're actually doing. So simple stuff, like just making a habit of actually getting your ass into the gym on a regular basis. That's huge, right? Build these small habits. Same thing with the nutrition, like start small, start ridiculously small. Like I give you a prime example. Like if you're currently just eating anything and everything and you got no structure to your plan, start by just saying, you know what, I'm going to add an extra serving of vegetables to, to my dinner this evening. Like that's it. I'm going to make sure I get an extra serving of vegetables with dinner this evening. You know, if you're not normally eating vegetables, well, by golly, I'm going to have vegetables. And that's, that's, you know, for the next week, that's your habit. Just make sure there's vegetables with dinner every evening. Once you got that done, then maybe you'll focus on like, hey, I'm going to improve lunch. Make sure that I'm getting protein and vegetables with lunch. And just that's your habit. Just nail that. Like so many people, when they think of starting a fitness program, they think like, I got to dive head first into the deep end, sink or swim, right? Like I got to go keto. I got to go carnivore. I got to go intermittent fasting. I got to work out six days a week, two hours a day. Like I got, I got to go all or nothing. And the problem with that is it's too big, too soon, and it's not sustainable. Like if, if you're currently doing nothing and then you try to go work out six days a week, two hours a day, like you, you can't sustain that. It's just shock to the system, shock to your lifestyle, and it's too much. You have to just start small and build from there. And that's why I like the whole method of the Atomic Habits book. And I utilize a lot of those same methods within the Muscle After 40 Blueprint coaching program as well. Like that's that small start small and build up is, is the, the whole premise behind our program. Right. And it's it's just about stacking up these little victories, these little wins. Right. That's what it's all about. So that's what I'd recommend for anybody starting back after a layoff, regardless of your situation. Just start small. Give yourself permission to take those tiny actions and then enjoy the journey. And then every little bit of victory you make is a, is a win. And like, don't get hung up on, oh, I used to be able to bench press 200 pounds back in the day and now I can't lift 135. Like, who gives a shit? Just show up to the gym and go through the motions right? Just show up. And then the, with the consistency, your strength is gradually going to start to bounce back. And the cool thing about rebuilding fitness after a layoff is you can always regain lost strength and muscle a lot quicker than it took you to gain it initially. I mean, if, if it took you years to build up to a certain level initially, like you could realistically regain that level of fitness within a few months of being consistent back to the gym. So you can always regain it a lot faster the second time around. So all you need is the consistency. That's the most important thing. All right. Uh, moving on. We got Pierce saying, awesome. Really appreciate it. I'll be hopping over to your channel. Thank you much. Oh, good. Glad to help. Glad to help. And Neil saying, thank you much. Have a great one. You're welcome, Neil. Uh, Emma's joining in. So she hasn't been online much and she mass missed the last few videos. Um, well, they're, they're, the replays are all posted up, right? That's the cool thing about these live video chats is all the replays are there. So if you do decide to go catching up on some of them, there's tons of them there in the playlist. Uh, what else we got there? DJ is joining in. I'm, I'm kind of cluing up because we've been going for over an hour here now. So I'm going to try and just wind her down here, folks. <laughs> wind her down. Just scroll through a few comments that are there. Um, should we lean off freeway? as we get older for joint health and lean towards machines or is it viable to use free weights until you get older? You know, I, I use mostly machines in my workouts these days. I, I've, I've made that switch and for a few reasons, one, it's a lot easier on the joints and I it's, it's safer, right? There's, there's less risk of injury with machine exercises because again, the machines help to balance and stabilize. And if you hit failure with the machine, 
it's it's usually pretty easy to get out of the machine <laughs> like for example like most chest press machines or something like that they've got the safety stops or or they're set up so that you're not pinned under a heavy barbell or anything like that so it's it's relatively safe uh, safer i mean I, every there's always a risk of injury with everything you do but it is safer and it's usually easier on the joints tendons and ligaments so i mean i still use free weights from time to time don't get me wrong but like 80 percent of my workouts is machine 20 percent is free weights that's that's usually like approximately what i do so yeah it's it's okay to do that especially as you get older and the thing that you need to look at is you're looking at this from a longevity point of view and the biggest thing that's going to have an impact on your long-term fitness is remaining injury free, right? Like that's the most important thing, obviously being consistent, but being consistent requires being injury free <laughs> because the only thing that you can do to set yourself back is, you know, as, as far as other than just flat out quitting is getting injured. Like that's, what's going to set you back because I mean, if, if you skip a workout, big deal, right? You can always work out again the next day. If you cheat on your diet, big deal. You can always clean it up and get back on track the next day. You know, if, if you know, you can always start again, like even if you had a layoff, right, you know, you can always start again. But if you get injured, right, you pull something, tear something, or, you know, you, you, you hurt yourself, you're not just jumping back the next day, right? It, injuries can take a long time to recover, especially as you get older, they take even longer to recover. And depending on the degree of the injury, you know, it may be a few weeks, maybe a few months, it might be a year, or in some cases, you may never fully recover from it. You know, it might always be haunting you for, for the rest of your life, depending on what kind of injury it was. So injury prevention is the most important thing. And, you know, that's why I'm such a big advocate of it. And to help me with that, you know, I, I utilize machine exercises for the majority of my workouts. And the cool thing about it these days, like you go to most commercial gyms, you've got a wide variety of machines to hit all your major muscle groups. I mean, they help to work through a full range of motion. And I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome, right? So, I mean, you're not, you're not at a disadvantage anymore, right? I mean, things have progressed a lot. And even when you look at a lot of top level bodybuilders, I mean, they use a lot of machine exercises in their workouts these days. All right, moving on. We have um, Steve is saying, uh, mine is sports and bot and sports and building muscle. I says I used to play wheelchair basketball. I guess I must have asked what your goals are, <laughs> but I respect that. Playing sports and building muscle. You know, uh, what else we got? And the burning element saying thanks, Lee. Appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome. John is joining in. He says, does adrenaline start a few hours after training? Mine does last a few hours, just the timed, the adrenaline. I'm on beta blockers. You can have more, like your body's going to be more hyped up after training, and it may take several hours for everything to return to normal. But, I mean, if, if you're on medication to control that, I mean, that might be a unique thing in your situation. Like, again, I'm not a doctor and I don't know what your, what your current situation is as far as, you know, health and medication and all that, but it is normal after training for your heart rate to remain elevated, your metabolism remain, remain elevated. Like your body is still amped up from the training, right? Like when you go to the gym and you train, you're getting all the, the hormones and the adrenaline and the endorphins and, and everything's, you know, you're amped up, right? And it's going to take a while. Like, it's not just like as soon as you finish the workout and you walk out the gym doors, like, a light switch it's on or off it's going to take a while for everything to to return to normal you know for your core temperature to come back down for your you know the all the hormones to return to baseline again right so and, and the harder you train the more of a this is going to take like if you really go out there and push it with a hard high intensity workout you're going to be amped up for a while afterwards and and this is something you really need to factor in for people who work out later in the evening because it's sometimes hard to unwind after a workout. It's not like you can just go train balls to the wall and then jump in the bed and fall asleep. Like some people may be able to do it, but a lot of people can't, you know, it usually takes you a couple hours to wind down after a training session to, to relax afterwards. So you want to factor that into your, to your routine. Now, if you're doing a workout earlier in the day, that can actually work to your advantage because it usually helps make you more productive during the day. But for those evening workouts, something you might want to consider because, you know, that could hinder your sleep quality, especially if you're doing late night workouts. 
Uh, I've got a few more questions and I'm going to clue it up. Um, Craig is joining in saying, I've been thinking of adding some mobility drills to my routine. What are your thoughts? Any suggestions on a beginner routine? Mobility, flexibility, all that stuff is, is critical. And what I do myself uh, with my workouts, I always finish off every training session with stretching out the muscles that I worked, right? So like I, I usually do total body workouts. So I kind of do like a total body stretch afterwards, but I take about 10 minutes after my workouts to just focus on stretching. And the key things that I really focus on, um, I, I do like a hanging from a pull-up bar, just, just grab the pull-up bar and hang from it and just help to stretch out your torso, your arms, your lats, your chest, your shoulders, all that helps to decompress the spine. That's a phenomenal stretch. Just grab a pull-up bar and hang from it. It's also a great grip exercise as well. And I, I use different grips. So, I mean, like a lot of pull-up bars these days, you know, they got the wide, narrow, parallel, angled grip handle. So I'll take advantage of them. So I'll use like a wide grip, hang there until my grip starts to fatigue, you know. And then for the next sesh, set, I'll do like a parallel grip or an angled grip. So I'll do at least three or four sets, you know, just gripping until my hanging from the pull-up bar until my grip fatigues and it's a great stretch for the upper body as well as decompressing the spine so that's a good one and then you know just touching your toes doing basic quad stretches doing like uh, hip flexor stretches you know i actually have a playlist uh, on youtube covering a whole series of stretches that you can do for all your major muscle groups so if you just go through the the playlists you'll see it there and it's actually broken down into like back stretches, leg stretches, chest, shoulders, arms, etc. So you can kind of pick and choose the ones that you want to focus on. But that's a big one. I always focus on stretching after each workout. And I find that it helps not only with recovery, but it does help with the mobility, injury prevention. And it also helps with your, your strength and explosiveness. Because if you have more flexibility in the joints, tendons, and ligaments, and in the muscles, you can be more explosive with your workouts. And it really does carry over to that. Like you'll see people who have good mobility. It, it helps to improve your overall fitness and power production all around. And you don't feel as stiff, right? So that's a big one. As far as the mobility, I mean, if you have any specific joint or, or stiffness issues, I mean, there's things you can certainly do to work around it. But I get a lot of that through my actual workouts themselves. Because, I mean, I always start off light, do several progressively heavier warm-up sets, you know, working through a full range of motion, working different movement patterns. And I always focus on, like, working agonist and antagonist muscle groups so that you're working both sides of the joint, both sides of the muscle. Right? You know, so I, I find that that kind of covers a lot of the mobility side of things. But then finishing it off with the stretching really helps as well. So that's how I go about it myself, right? I mean, that's my personal routine. Um, and hopefully you can take some of that and, and implement it into your own and get some benefit from it. Current news is saying, what workout split would you suggest for advanced trainers and how they add, how should they add cardio along with it? It's, as far as the trainers, it depends on your schedule, what it is you're training for. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of variables there. I mean, I consider myself to be somewhat of an advanced trainer. I mean, I've been doing it for over 30 years. So I guess that kind of puts me in the more advanced category. And I still do total body workouts because I enjoy them. I find they work well for me. And I just, you know, at this, for, for my goals at this stage, this is what I want to focus on. But back when I was competing in bodybuilding, I did a lot of the classic body part splits, you know, whether it was a push pull legs or, or going through chest, back, legs, shoulders, arms, whatever. You know, I, I did a lot of those. Uh, one that I found very effective from a muscle building and bodybuilding hypertrophy point of view was positions of flexion. And I actually have a playlist covering a full positions of flexion workout series. Uh, it's right on my, go to my main YouTube channel, open up the playlist and just look for it. Or again, you can do a search for Lee Hayward positions of flexion right on my channel. You should find it. But that was a really good program from a pure bodybuilding hypertrophy point of view. And the thing, positions of flexion basically means that you're working all the major muscle groups through a full range of motion, mid-range, fully stretched, peak contraction. So each workout would generally consist of three main exercises for each of your major muscle groups. Now, you could do more, but the, the idea is 
a mid range. So to kind of give you an example, if we're training chest, a mid range would be some sort of bench press because it's a heavy compound exercise, but most of the tension is in the mid range. You don't really get a full stretch in the bottom and you can lock it out at the top. A fully stretched exercise is like a dumbbell fly. So in that case, you get a deep stretch in the bottom, but then you can lock it out at the top and there's not a lot of tension at the top of the movement. A peak contraction exercise would be a pec deck fly. So in that case, it's, it's very similar movement pattern to a dumbbell fly, but the tension is reversed. So instead of overemphasizing the stretch, you really have to fight to hold the handles together at the top. So you get that peak contraction element in there. And having that mid-range, fully stretched, peak contraction, I found that that was very effective from a hypertrophy point of view because you're, again, getting very complete development for all your major muscle groups. So that's positions of flexion. And that's one that I would recommend. I mean, a lot of my advanced coaching students, we utilize that into their programs, positions of flexion. So if, if you want to check it out, just go to my main YouTube channel and check that out. Or if you want me to help you with it, feel free to email me. We can chat about it as well. Um, as far as adding cardio, I mentioned that there's ideally you would weight train one day cardio the next. That's how I usually recommend it for most people. But you could also add in the cardio after the weight training as well if you want to do it that way. Like again, I've done it both ways. It's not one is right, wrong, good or bad. It's like what's ideal for you and what it is that you're training for at this stage of the game. So you know, it's, it's really an individual thing. So if you want to really break this down into more detail and come up with a more specific approach for you, feel free to reach out, right? I mean, there's my email, my, my Facebook, you know, reach out, right? I mean, uh, there, <laughs> that's the easiest thing to do. Uh, Scourge 237. Glad to be here. How's it going? Welcome Scourge. Glad to have you joining in. We're doing great. Uh, Mike is saying, great work with these Q&As. Thank you. You're much, uh, you're, you're very welcome and, and your feedback is appreciated. Thank you, Mike. Got Bob V joining in and said, what long head tricep exercises are easy on the elbow tendon? Is there a compound exercise for this muscle? Um, a lot of times when you do tricep exercises for the long head, it's just usually a stretch exercise. So when I was mentioning the positions of flexion, mid-range, fully stretched, peak contraction. To hit that long head, we're usually doing a stretch exercise. So it's some form of like an overhead tricep extension, some sort of skull crusher type of exercise. And the problem with a lot of those movements is they can place strain on the elbow joint. So if that is a case, uh, what you could try doing is try doing some cable exercises, you know, doing those exercises with a, a cable instead of free weights or maybe even a resistance band. You could try that. I find... Cables, resistance bands, and even some tricep machines, like there's a lot of cool tricep machines available these days that can kind of mimic those movement patterns as well. They tend to be less jarring on the joints than free weights, right? Like free weights, it's it can be very hard on the joints because again, it's the resistance is, is just dead weight against gravity, right? So it's not an even strength uh, curve like when you're doing the movement patterns, like sometimes you'll get a, a peak and a spike throughout the exercise range of motion. Whereas when you're using cables, it's consistent resistance along the full path. So I find that the cables can sometimes be easier on the joints. Whereas when you're doing the free weights, sometimes when you're in those weaker ranges of motion and, and the weaker joint angles, it can place a lot of stress on the elbows. And I found this myself, like I used to have some elbow tendonitis and elbow pain doing certain exercises like that. And that's how I worked around them is I would incorporate cables and machine exercises for those movements instead. And I found that that helped. But the big one to focus on is if any exercise is causing pain or discomfort, like don't do it, <laughs> like focus on another movement pattern instead. And, and even when it comes to the triceps, like don't get hung up in like the long head, the short head and all like, as long as you're doing a tricep exercise, like all three heads of the triceps are still going to come into play regardless. It's just some exercises will emphasize one of those heads more so than the other, right? Like a fully stretched exercise will emphasize the long head a bit more so than uh, a peak contraction or a compound exercise. But with that being said, all tricep exercises, you're still contracting the entire triceps. Like there's, there's really no such thing as a true isolation exercise because there's multiple muscles come into play anytime, right? Like every time you contract, like 
it all the muscles are contracting there. It's not just like one muscle, like one individual muscle is contracting. Like everything is contracting. It's just you'll find that more certain movements will emphasize more of that muscle than other movements. Right? Like for example, like even if you're doing a bicep curl, a standing bicep curl, like it's more than just your biceps coming into play. I mean, your core has to come into play. Your forearms have to come into play. Your back has to come into play. So, I mean, even a bicep curl, you could make an argument that it's a total body exercise because of all the muscles that had to come into play just to stabilize your body to do the bicep curl. But where is the majority of the stress, you know, the, the actual stress that's creating hypertrophy? Well, it, it's in the biceps. But like I say, it, all the muscle groups are going to come into play. So I wouldn't even get hung up on trying to isolate the long head of the triceps, especially if you're working around elbow pain. Just focus on doing tricep exercises that don't cause elbow pain. That's the most important thing. All right. I think that's all the questions that came through. So there we go, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the video chats. Went an hour and 25 minutes. That's, that's, doesn't surprise me. Right? I always say I'm going for an hour ish, right? And I don't know how long the ish part is, but it's guaranteed to be an hour. There we go. So we got a 25 ish. Hour 25. Hopefully you enjoyed the video chats. And uh, I'm going to clue it up now, right? It's getting late. My belly's rumbling. Time for dinner. And uh, if you do have any questions, comments, or feedback, feel free to email me, right? Reach out to me through email, leeh at leehayward.com, or friend me up on Facebook. I'm active over there, and we can chat through Messenger. And if you would like some help, you know, with a customized workout program, you know, if you want to come on board with the Muscle After 40 Blueprint Coaching Program, feel free to reach out to me about that. And, you know, we can even schedule in for a strategy session call. That's something that I do. And I got all the details for that down in the description of this video below as well. So if you want some help, just ask, right? You know, that's, that's the secret, right? If, if, you, if you want, ask. Ask and, it shall, ask and you shall receive. There we go. <laughs> all right, guys, have yourself a good one. Have yourself a great weekend. And I look forward to talking to you next time. Take care. Over and out. And...